Okay, welcome to Sam.GovBids Live, guys, where we walk through small business solicitations together and answer your questions along the way. Today, we have four small business solicitations pulled up, and we will be jumping into those uh, together in just a second, and I'll share my screen, and we'll get to go through those step by step. But if you are new here and you don't want to miss a future episode, consider subscribing and clicking that notification bell. That way, you can ask your questions live on future streams if you're able to catch us live. And if you happen to be somebody who's recently registered your business in SAM and you're looking to actually get started bidding, check out my website, GovKid Method, for free and paid resources that were designed specifically to support new federal contractors just like you. So I'll go ahead and show you a quick glance of my screen here of the four bids that we will be uh, tackling today. So we have uh, Aquarium Curator Services, we have lodging services, we have janitorial, and we also have chemist services, okay? Today's a little bit of a unique kind of fun. Um, I try to like group these per session in a way that kind of makes sense. And these are kind of like random miscellaneous, uh, but they're all professional service based. So that's kind of what we're looking at today. Do see a few um, comments. What's up, Christian? Uh, hello, E. For last quest, we will get to questions in a few minutes um, as we go in between bids. So we will just go ahead and get started with the first one here for the Aquarium Curator Service. So this is for the National you know, Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, also known as NOAA. This bid's due September 9th, small business set aside, and the place performance is actually in Juneau, Alaska. They are letting us know this simplified acquisition procedures. So this whole job is going to be under 250K. They're giving us a little bit of a background saying this, you know, this aquarium is, let's see. Looks like they have, yeah, five individual tanks ranging from 100 to 2,500 gallons. And again, this is going to be for an aquarium curator. But to be honest, I'm not entirely sure what those duties are. So they're gonna give us those here in just a second. This pos position is directly responsible, <clears throat> excuse me, for all facets of the operation, maintenance of the aquarium, and will work under supervision of the facility manager. They are letting you know, which is pretty helpful. The anticipated number of hours are gonna be 10 to 20 per week. And the very specific duties are gonna be to collect and transport uh, fish, specimens, assist by keeping records. Looks like more records and ensure proper permitting. Next, assist in the development of exhibits responsible for, for feeding twice weekly. Okay, so there's gonna be one person for 10 to 20 hours per week, care and routine maintenance of the exhibits and the aquarium systems. Three times a year, they're going to need the tanks partially drained. This way they can do more of a full cleaning. You're going to have to work with staff for education outreach, communicate uh, exhibit requirements to the staff, and then lastly, feed and care of the animals also in the wet lab. So those are very, very specific duties. If you were going to be recruiting, this is more of a staffing contract. So if you're going to be finding somebody, these are the about, you know, just under a dozen duties that you would be qualifying them for. Looks like for the year, they're saying it'll be up to uh, 1,040 hours. Or, or maybe this is an additional because they're saying on-call labor. So is it 10 to 20 hours a week plus on-call stuff? We'll, we'll try to find out. Vendor must be able to work weekends and evenings. And then qualifications. Basically, they want you to have experience in all these areas. A bachelor's of science in fisheries. Pass the secure, security check. And experience with communicating knowledge about aquarium uh, to the public. So the base is actually, this contract is going to start. Once it's awarded, it's going to start... September 16th of this year, and it is 
1,040 hours for the year. So we did get clarification on that because it's going to be a base plus two option year. So a three-year contract. Um, again, they're letting you know it's underneath simplified acquisition, which they did raise, but they're telling you it's under 150. So it's actually under 150. Shouldn't be a big surprise based on what we've seen. And based off of what we've seen, we have gathered a lot of information about how to price this, what the job entails. Now we just need to really find out exactly what they want from you in your, your bid. Now, the interesting part here is there's no attachments. It's absolutely nothing. No attachments to look at, no solicitation, no government forms whatsoever. So this is where we rely on our skills because at some point you do have to make assumptions because the government does not always give you everything that you need. So you could start off by asking a question. Again, this is due in, what, a week? September 9th. So about a week and a half. Yeah, so you, Heather Mail, we could ask for a format that they want the quote to be in. We could ask, do you need us to demonstrate a resume to assure that we are acceptable in terms of the qualifications as well as the duties that are bullet pointed here. So you could ask questions to contracting since we have zero format, zero attachments. Okay. We say the rule with government forms is we don't go looking for them. So we're not going to go look for like an SF 1449 form or reps and certs or pricing clearance to fill out because they were not provided, but we could ask contracting what, do you want from me or more specifically, do you want this? Do you just want a price? You know, do you, you want me to write to these? Do you want a resume? Okay. Before moving forward on this, you could ask these questions or you can make an assumption, which you would be fair to do because there is nothing provided to you. So you could do one or two of those. You have the hours. Okay. We know what the job is. So this is extremely basic, extremely oversimplistic, but could be a three-year contract that is, you know, under a hundred K. And for somebody who's looking to get into professional services, maybe not a bad way to go. Again, though, remember this is in uh, Juneau, Alaska. So probably the last point you're going to be staffing you're going to be looking for talent probably in the city of, of Juneau. All right. Um, Christian said, can we look at the process of subcontracting? So yeah, just let me know what specific questions you have for me to go through like a whole, a whole process could take the entire session. So if there's something specific I can help you with, um, feel free to let me know. Thank you for this, by the way. Absolutely. Uh, Eva Velasquez says, do you have anything for 484121? Um, you tell me. Again, let, you let me know if you have specific questions. Uh, I don't think we have anything in terms of our four bids today. But again, I, uh, I'm here to answer questions. I need something specific to work with if I'm going to uh, try to help you. So that was our first one. Very straightforward. And I think... To, honestly, I think today it's going to be pretty straightforward as well. Next one is for lodging services for a senior leader spiritual event. See what I mean? Like, did we know that the government bought these type of things? So this is for the Army, Honolulu, due August 31st, due in two days. It's going to be for hotels in Honolulu. We have one attachment which is the solicitation. So we will go ahead and take a look at that. So we have 32 page solicitation. They are calling this a draft, but apparently they're using it. Straight into the statement of work. Also the SF 1449 form here as well, but we know we're gonna be looking for a hotel. So this could include providing food, providing uh, conference rooms, providing audiovisual equipment. It could in include those things. It may not. 
but this is for a spiritual retreat. So we don't know what type of support they're going to need, or is it just going to be straight lodging and they're going to be going off the grounds? We don't know. So these are the type of things I'm thinking and looking for as I scroll through this. We do have a little bit of specific tasks. They're telling us 24 rooms. Okay. 18 doubles and six Kings starting September 30th, going through October 2nd. So that'd be 30, 31, one and two. So up to four days, food will be provided by the hotel as well as two meeting rooms. Okay. They want one main and one child room. They do want audio video equipment as well as I was just uh, guessing. So projector screen, microphone, speakers and parking. They will usually be a lot more specific than this, but today, high level. They're just saying food. They're not saying breakfast, lunch, and dinner, lunch and dinner, or just dinner. They haven't said. They also haven't said what type of food, you know, hot breakfast, cold breakfast. These are things that are can be important, I'll say, but they have not clarified. In which case, pretty much every hotel is going to provide at a high level what they've asked for. Okay, so now we're getting to our performance summary where they decided to include some more of those details. So they're saying September 30th, dinner, October 1st, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and October 2nd, uh, breakfast. So one dinner, then breakfast, lunch, and, or I'm sorry, two dinners, and then two breakfasts and one lunch. So that helps. And that's going to be provided by the hotel, which means the hotel is going to have to include that in their quote to you, if you're going to be calling up hotels on this thing. And again, this is small business set aside. Correct. They're fleshing out some more times for us here, which is good. Pretty much the same info that they've requested. So now in terms for your instruction to offers, what they need for you in your bid right here. This is an RFQ request for quote. They want you to sign that first page as the 1449 form. They also want to submit your company quote for this. Okay. They did not give us pricing cleanse that I've seen. So this is going to be like in your own word doc pricing table type thing. You may even want to try to recreate one of these deliverable tables that they've given you as well. Submission of quotes will only be received to Mr. Alex bonus. If there's amendments, you need to acknowledge those. There are no amendments as of yet, and this isn't due in two days, so it's not very likely. And that's, that's it. Basis for award, how the winning bidder will be chosen. It's going to be on price alone, which you can infer is going to be a lowest price alone. So also uh, lowest price technically acceptable. Past performance will not be evaluated factor. Okay. So they did put the pricing cleanse down here. So these are what you need to, fi to fill out. You do not need to create that table. We just take it page by page here. So starting on page 17 of 32, they're giving you the lodging. And this is going to be for the rooms specifically, the price of the rooms from the 30th to the 2nd for 18 doubles and six kings. Number two, they want you to break out the meals. Okay, so five meals. So when you get your quote from the hotel, you're gonna also need them to break out the quote. That way they're not just rolling it into one number because they're gonna say, well, how much, how much is it for the meals specifically? We need it broken out. When it comes to pricing guys, anytime the government gives you a price breakdown or irregardless, however, they're asking for the pricing. If you're relying on a sub, you need to have them provided to you in the same format that the government's asking of it from you. That way you get it from the sub and then you can put your markups and whatever else you got to do to the pricing. And then you submit it and everything's apples to apples to apples. Too many times people try to just, or, or I should say subs try to just pass off a number to us and say, here's my number. And it's like, no, do you know how the government works? Let me educate you. The government needs to see this, this, and this. Therefore, I also need to see this, this, and this. You need to be bold. You need to be confident in what you're asking for in the subs. Do not let the subs dictate you because I know that it feels vulnerable because you're relying on them for pricing. 
but you need to be the one in control. You need to retain that power from the get go. So when you see things like this, you kind of just got to set that expectation up front, especially when it comes to pricing. And then we have the meeting rooms. So remember they had the one main room and then also the, the child room. So they want pricing uh, broken out for that. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. So they also want uh, the AV equipment rental. So that's going to be a separate price. And then they also uh, parking. So it's up to you if you want to charge them for parking. I don't think the hotel is going to give you pricing for parking unless there is no parking and it's either a, val a valet or it's like a parking structure and they validate. If it's something like that, then sure, there will be pricing available uh, for parking. So you'll just kind of have to see what the situation is going to look like at your particular hotel in Juneau, Alaska that you're going to be contacting. But here you go. There's no past performance required. Pricing only and it's lowest price. And they want you to fill out these five clints as well as the SF 1449 form. Boxes 30A, B, and C and 17A as well. That's what your bid response is going to look like to this. Extremely easy. Okay. And it's just whoever the lowest price is. If you're the lowest price, you're, you're going to win. Looks like we will have some reps and certs. So we will want to check those boxes as well. And that, my friend, is it. That's everything. All right. Um, let's see here. Brian, what's going on, Brian? Great to see you, stranger, as well. Glad to see you're still bringing valuable resources to the GovCom community. Hey, I appreciate that, Brian. Um, good to see you, man. Thanks for hanging out with us for sure. Yeah, we're still we're still going strong. Absolutely, we we're back to doing um, the lives for a while. So great opportunities to to connect and ask questions. And guys, if you're new here, um, we ask we answer questions in between bids. So feel free to put those in the chat as, as you have them, especially if it relates to the bids we're looking at because those are the most relevant form of questions. But if you have something else uh, that you're just like stuck on and you're dying to ask the question, um, we also can help you out with those as well, okay? I'm here to, to bring value. That's why we do these for an hour long to try to help out as many people as, as we can. And like Brian said, offer some value. Next, we have Big Water Visitor Center janitorial service okay so the department of the interior small business set aside janitorial NAICS code due tomorrow okay so this is going to be more of an example probably rather than a real life thing that you're going to go after if, just because of the time element in terms of attachments we have a solicitation doc statement of work Inspection report. Looks like maybe some uh, some drawings. Wage determination. Your evaluation. How the winning bidder will be chosen. We have an amendment, as well as the amendment uh, amendment amended statement of work. So let me see. Okay, we're good. We'll just dig into the solicitation first. Remember, this is for janitorial services. We'll see what we're working with. So this is the solicitation, 34 pages long. At a minimum, page one, right out of the gate. They're telling you what they want. Sign the SF-1449 form, which, yeah, it's going to be the next page. Then they want three volumes. Volume one, technical. Volume two, past performance. Volume three, price. So your response is going to consist of breaking down three different volumes as well as signing the SF 1449 form, which we have here. We can gauge that the uh, period of performance to start a work for these janitorial services will be October 1st. This is another RFQ. And it looks like we have a base plus four. That's going to extend all the way throughout September of 2027. Crazy stuff. 
So we have some clauses here, definitions. And I mentioned this on a previous episode, guys, but when you get to those, those regulations, just know not all of the regulations apply to you. The ones that have the X's or the checks next to them are the ones that apply to you. If you're trying to if you're trying to skill up on your FAR game, that's that's what that means. FAR meaning federal acquisition regulations. Okay, yep. So we've been kind of going through some reps and certs here. They're saying uh, provide the price on the SF 1449 form. Pretty easy, reps and certs. So coming back to the price and CLIN, those would be located here. So page four, they're not asking for, or I haven't seen yet any sort of hourly breakdown. So your price is just gonna be your all in price for the year. Now, I really need to see the statement of work because janitorial, it could be once a week, twice a week, three times a week. It could also include things like uh, semi-annual floor cleaning and carpet cleaning and waxing and all that stuff, uh, window washing, things like that. So we'll have to dig into some of these other documents to find that out since they have not priced those things out separately. So here's a statement of work. And remember, we do have amendments, so we, will, we won't forget about those as well to see what changes were made. So this is going to be in uh, Big Water, Utah. They have a main office building, outside grounds, and a pavilion area, kind of giving us, painting a picture for us of what we're working with. They are telling us the work week is, at, in fact, three days a week, Monday, Thursday, and Saturday. So that answered that one. They're giving us business hours, holidays. Now I want to see what those specific duties are next. So trash removal, restrooms, specifically uh, toilet bowls, stalls, sinks, floors, walls baby changing stations and just servicing uh, toilet paper, paper towel, hand soap. And that's going to be filled with government furnished supplies. So you don't have to price that in. They're going to give you the toilet paper and, and the, have a stock room. You just have to, you know, pull from it. Also this uh, janitorial utility storage area, probably that same stock room I was just referring to. They are going to be performing inspections and we do have a map attached separately. So kind of a high, high level uh, map. We know the main building, the restrooms. Okay. So, and you know, you would provide this to your sub. It's somewhat helpful. Your sub would preferably go and do a drive by if not do a site visit for you. So evaluation, let's see what it's going to be, uh, how the winning bidder will be chosen. So it's going to be pass fail. I say that sometimes the government also says it. You have to meet the minimum. So remember those three volumes, technical, pass performance, price. Your technical is going to be pass fail, basically on your ability to de demonstrate staff experience and being able to provide those duties outlined in the statement of work. So you would need to write to this. Next, also demonstrate experience working on, so this is gonna be past performance. I think they're not saying it, but recent projects, similar scope and size within the last three years, you know, that's past performance. And then in lieu of contract experience, you may also submit a, a business plan if you don't have anything to list. And then also submit a brief written narrative that demonstrates the ability to assemble a team and again, complete all those tasks within the statement of work. So it's, it's straightforward. You provide this, if you do a good enough job providing this, it's gonna be pass fail. 
you will pass. And then next, they actually have pass performance broken down in its own section. So a little confusing where they ask for experience in multiple sections within the technical, but then they also go to pass performance on its own section, but just give them what they're asking for. It is extremely redundant in this case. In this case, they want uh, three pass performance examples. And again, if you don't have it, um, you can provide them that business plan. But in this section, if you don't have it, you shall shall or shall not be uh, rated favorably or unfavorably. Okay, it's not going to help you if you don't have it, but it's not going to hurt you. And then lastly, again, the price is going to go on the SF1449 form. So I, I skipped over it, but best value as well. So even though the technical is going to be pass fail, the overall response with technical pass performance and price is going to be best value. So the lowest bidder is not necessarily going to be who wins. It's going to be what's most advantageous to the government in terms of value. And then I think lastly, we'll just go ahead and check in on our amendments for the solicitation and that statement of work. So the purpose of this amendment is to update the statement of work. Okay. And when you ever, guys, whenever you have an amendment, you need to also acknowledge this formally by print signing and dating. So let's see if they highlighted some changes for us. They did. So they're including the square footage. There may have been questions. So for each building, it's 425 square feet or 2750 or 2000. And that looks like it's the only change. So they just included the square footage for you to help you estimate the pricing and uh, how much time and how much manpower it's going to be required. So let me go ahead and close these out. Awesome. All right. Top dog says, uh, dig into HHS, DHA and VA. Again, um, let me know what questions you have. Digging into this is too general for me. I'm not sure exactly what you want me to dig into. So if you have specific questions, just post them in the chat. And we are going pretty quick today. So, um, we only have one more solicitation left. Usually it takes us a whole hour, but we don't have as many questions today. So Marine Chemist Services for Hot Work at Naval Base Point Loma. This is Navy due the 30th. So again, due tomorrow. Small business set aside, 541990 NAICS code for professional scientific and technical services to be performed in San Diego, California. This is a request for quote, um, specifically over at uh, Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Done some work there myself. They did copy and paste some info here into the listing description. So I'm kind of just going through that. They are telling us the evaluation is the lowest price. Here it is, lowest price. But you do have to first be found to be technically acceptable. Meaning your submission clearly meets the minimum requirements. That's how you're found to be acceptable. You're unacceptable if you do not meet those. Pretty straightforward. Price quotes shall be in accordance with the solicitation and be evaluated on the basis of price reasonableness. So again, they don't wanna see unbalanced pricing. They don't wanna see crazy high, crazy low numbers. Your numbers need to make sense. So they did do a full copy and paste job. So let's see what attachments we have. We have the RFQ solicitation doc, and then we have a separate statement of work. So we'll start with the RFQ. All right, open that up. Okay. So this is just five pages long. We're not seeing what like what we would typically see, like SF 1449 form. 
we're just seeing kind of like a cover page with some yellow highlights with some blank places to fill in like your company info, your signature, your date, etc. So pretty intuitive to fill that out. Again, to remind ourselves here and to remind me, Marine Chemist Services. But when we're looking at this, it's kind of unique because it's for visits. So for the Marine Chemist, for the base year, it's going to be 40 visits. Okay, then additional spaces per visit, 80 each, and then standby time, 48 each. Not really sure what those units are telling us besides the visits. Not sure what these additional spaces and standby time means, but we can also derive this as a base plus four option years. And the job will begin September 15th of this year. And we just have some FAR clauses. That's it. So not, not much at all. All of these today have been extremely, extremely uh, simple. So because I don't know what these spaces and standby time means, let's jump over to that statement of work. And if you guys don't know, I don't ever look at these ahead of time. I do it so I can go through them with you live on purpose because I don't want to have everything figured out. I'd rather figure it out with you. Or if I can't figure it out, tell you what you as a bidder, your next steps should be to kind of, you know, push through this or make a bid, no bid or, or whatever it's going to be. So they're saying the estimated work hours, four hours per visit, and then scheduled visits up to 40 visits are authorized. And then it says up to 80 additional tanks, spaces, compartments are also authorized under this order. Not really sure what that means. Maximum of 12 hours standby time while not performing chemist duties is also authorized under this. That I understand the standby time. That's really all that we have to work with. So if you ever find yourself where you're not really 100% understanding something like with this additional spaces per visit, you can ask the question to contracting, okay? Because here's the thing, you know, it's, you're gonna have questions. There's gonna be things that you do not understand and every bit is different. So you're not always going to have it figured out. And this is the this is why so many struggle with bidding and trying to understand this stuff. Because you think you got something figured out, and then you move to the next one, and then it's different. And then everything you learned can sometimes feel like it goes out the window, and then you got to learn something a little bit different. And then repeat, repeat, repeat. And then it's like, you can never get any solid ground underneath your feet because there's no solid like feedback coming to you for doing the same thing again and again and again. So the best way to approach it in the way with, you know, the clients that I work with is we have a, a loose structure. So the structure part of it is, okay, you can bank on this. Okay. And when you come to challenges, you can do this, but then the loose part is being flexible, not having expectations, not necessarily being afraid of not having all the information, but being committed to getting as much of that info as you can. And whether that's through doing research, you know, hopping on fpds.gov, or again, submitting RFIs to contracting, uh, things like that. This is how, this is why it's building a puzzle. And I say this again and again and again, we're starting with a puzzle. There's a bunch of pieces. We don't know, you know, which order they go in. We start by trying to put those corner pieces together. We try to build like an outline of what this is going to look like. And then we start to put together some of the meaty sections. And before too long, we start to get an idea. Every single bid is like that. And it's starting over. And the reason I like to spend time on these easier ones. And that's why a lot of the ones that we see are RFQs with like a little bit of a write-up is so that you can get to the point of crawling to walking and you can start to create that semi-structured approach so that when you do 
go against things that are say full blown RFPs, or they're just more comprehensive, like where they're asking for three volumes, then at least you have an approach to move forward with. And it's going to be like taking the training wheels off kind of thing. So, so for this, like I was saying, um, anything you don't understand, you ask, you ask the questions. Okay. You ask the questions. It should be a standard operating procedure to ask questions on every bid that you go after, unless it's just so simple, stupid, you don't need to. But I also like to ask questions as an informal way of, of marketing, of letting contracting know and demonstrating to them, showing them interest in their procurement so that they already know who, who we are before we respond to the bid. Okay, so I'm a big believer in indirect marketing, not like, here's my CAPE statement, shove it in your face and you know, let's go to a conference and pass out a hundred of those. Um, I'm not as big of a believer in that. It's kind of a good way to, I don't know, like where does that lead? Versus backing up from something that is real and that you're investing real time in and that contracting really cares about. So you're speaking their language and you're talking something about what your customer cares about. I'd rather you spend the time there. So just, you know, simple ways of getting in front of them and always, you know, asking uh, for the debrief. You know, that's huge. Okay. But it's also related to the bid. You don't just ask for debriefs willy nilly. You have to have bid on it first. So you might as well double down and invest the time in marketing on the bids that you're going after and with the people who are going to be awarding the contract instead of trying to market yourself to people who have no way of giving you a contract because you haven't bid on anything that they have out on the market. The most number one thing contracting is going to tell you is please see sam.gov. So we start there so that when we do get in front of them, we can have real conversations instead of like, here's my NAICS codes, you know, do you have any contracts for me? It's just, you know, a, a terrible way of, of marketing in my opinion. Uh, Dr. Virginia, nice to see you again. Uh, thanks for making sure we understand the government language. Please explain what base plus four option means. So base is a reference term for base year. And then option is referencing option years. So for example, a base year would be 12 months, but the government has the opportunity very often to continue working with the same contractor for one year, for two years, for three years, for four years sometimes through executing option years. So, okay, we're going to do this again for another year kind of thing. They are not obligated. If you are not doing a good job, if you are defaulting on the contract, they will not uh, execute those option years. But if you are doing a good job, then a one-year contract could turn into, like I said, a three, four, or five-year contract, which would be amazing for you. So you want to make sure that even if you're working with subs, that you're very involved so that you can not only get you know quality past performance ratings and evals, but also so that you can extend the contract if that is something that's offered for that particular solicitation. Okay, not every contract has option years, but a lot of them, maybe even in some cases, the majority of very small business contracts, because it's money for contracting and it's time, which is also money to go through the procurement process. So if they had to do the same thing over and over and over each and every year, that would just be more money and more time wasted, not wasted, but, but spent versus, hey, we're going to renew for, for a year. So that's what we're referencing. 100%. Um, it's super important to understand that because it is something you're going to see if you are going to be in the space. Yep. Top Dog said it as well. One year. And if you perform well enough, they will sign for the additional years. 100%. You got it. All right, guys. Any other questions? That is the four bids for today. We just flew through them faster than we we ever have. If you have questions, please, you know, make them specific so that I can try to help and answer them. Um, so I'll give you guys just a minute to see if there is anything that you come up with. Otherwise, we will call it a, an early session.
tech shop guy says two years ago, I got a contract at a dam and the contract showed in the plan stop logs showed how to build them. Then in the specs said no stop logs are part of the contract. Which way should I have bid it? So tech shop, if you're saying that you received con uh, you've seen contradictory information, you should have gotten that clarification before bidding because otherwise you're putting yourself at a risk of either pricing too low and then being asked to do something or pricing too high to do something that wasn't required and maybe pricing yourself out of a competitive range. So if you ever receive conflicting information, you always need to make sure that you get the clarification from contracting because how, how could you, you know what I mean? Your question is the same question that I would, I would put back on you. How, how can you bid it? If you're telling me it's stop logs and then don't stop logs, you know, and, and this is, this is why I encourage everybody who's bidding. You are the experts, not contracting. Contracting also makes mistakes. They're also in high turnaround positions, turnover positions. Many of them are also very new. Okay. They're also using a lot of copy and paste. A few episodes ago, we saw them leave something in from a totally different contract where it did not line up at all with what they were asking for in the pricing. If you just move forward with that, cause you're uh, timid or afraid, or you don't know how to ask for the clarification, then there's going to be a mistake made and it's going to fall on you and you're going to waste your own time. So it's for everybody. It's just learning to have confidence. You are the expert. And if you have questions or something doesn't make sense, just know there are mistakes made all over the place. Okay. And almost every single contract out there, you can bet there's at least going to be some small mistake. So if you know, you're looking for that and, and maybe it's not even a mistake. Okay. Maybe there's nothing technically wrong with it. But the way they're presenting it to you as the expert, you're saying that doesn't make sense. That needs to be clarified. You should plan on asking for that, requesting that every time that you see it. Like I said, it's just a standard operating procedure. If you're going to bid on SAM, don't expect contracting to, you know, have everything right the first time. And that is the purpose for amendments. Why we see amendments very often because they make a tweak, they make a change. Maybe they forgot to add something in, you know, it's they're human, they're human as well. And then the last thing with that is they're working on a lot of contracts. So, you know, you're all in on this one solicitation. They're going to spend the next week working on it. They're working on 10 others. Okay. So don't expect them to be as an invested sometimes on it as even you are right which you think they would be but i'm just telling you if they're working on one they're working on many all the more reason for you to, to help them and have to help yourself out i called some other guy and he said order of precedence does that change your answer no nothing i'm very confident in the answers that i give i don't know who the other guy is i don't it doesn't really matter to me um I, and I, I disagree with that too. Did you sign the contract? So you bid with stop logs and was awarded. Um, and then the contract came back, no stop logs. Guess you won less work, more money. Yeah, you just have to have clarification, guys. Like, don't, I don't know how you would have priced this with, with, with knowing these two things are at odds. If it comes to me, like if, if I'm bidding or I'm working with somebody who's bidding, and it's unclear until I get the clarification, I move on to the next bid. Okay. I'm not desperate. There's so much stuff on Sam to bid on. I'm not desperate. And I've heard, I, I've, I have learned the hard lessons multiple times. Okay. There is such a thing as bad business. Okay. So we never want to be desperate. We never want to be so in on a contract. We want it so much. Sometimes we make it to be something it's not because we want it so badly or we're willing to overlook certain things because we want it so badly. It can be very dangerous to your business, to your reputation. If those flags are being thrown, but you decide to move forward anyways, because you just want it so badly, the better way. And, and this is again, guys, this is why we, we, we play the numbers game. Okay. Because you're not going to win every bid that you go after. You're not going to win most of the bids that you go after. So all the more reason to diversify yourself and to have a pipeline. 
and to have a funnel and to have a prospecting system and a qualifying system and a bidding system and a winning system. Okay. Those are the four things that I'm always working with my coaching clients on uh, because otherwise the mental game really can have us make decisions or that, that are not in the best interest of the business. You know, say you had four people that are working for you. Would you still make these types of decisions knowing that if it goes wrong, maybe it costs them their jobs because you take on a contract where you're losing money because you missed something and now you can't afford to pay them, you know? like So we have to make decisions that are good for the business overall and take our personal emotions and our, our gut reactions and things out of it because they can cause us to make costly mistakes. And I've, I've been there myself. I've learned that lesson. Okay. And there's guys that are out there that are, that are bidding and they're, they're saying, Hey, I'm bidding. So learn from me or whatever. And maybe they have not learned those hard lessons. Okay. That's why I dedicate hundred percent of my time with working with clients to shorten the learning curve and to avoid those, those costly mistakes. And that's also what I try to provide to you doing this live. All right. Any last minute questions, guys? Um, we'll take it from there. And after that, we will call it a session. I hope everybody's having a great start to your week, morning or afternoon, depending on where you are located. And we are also streaming to um, LinkedIn. YouTube, of course, and then these episodes are all also uploaded on uh, Spotify. So if you're a podcast type person, um, this is something we just started a couple of weeks ago. Feel free to go over to Spotify, check us out if you prefer to, you know, like listen, you know, listen on the phone or listen on the, the radio while you're driving in your car. We are uploading all of these episodes to Spotify. And I've also learned that Spotify has a, a video option as well, which is a new thing but the audio only versions are they are there as well. So pretty cool. Um, and yeah, guys, uh, let me see here. If you have not checked it out, I do have a few resources over at my website, govkidmethod.com. If you are looking, if you're, you're brand new, you're looking to kind of just figure this stuff out. Are you a fit or maybe you're struggling with past performance issues or you want to know how to subcontract or middleman legally, I created a whole free training based off of that. So you just got to go to my website, click on this button and it will take you there totally free. If you are looking for additional support services like uh, proposal templates, capability statements, and our, our first fed bid program, the course only portion, we've extracted that out so that it can be more affordable for some folks. Um, we've included all that together in a bidding bundle. And then lastly, if you are looking to work on, you know, bids uh, together, and be more of a, a coaching type program where we meet twice a week over Zoom. Uh, we have that option as well. If you're looking, and if you're seriously looking at, at getting support and it's just me in there. So I don't have any other coaches or nobody I pass you off on. Um, the clients that I work there uh, within there, they get me twice a week over Zoom. So just know those resources are there for you as well. Um, if you haven't seen those, I highly recommend if nothing else, go through the free training. It's free, you got nothing to lose. It's a solid hour jam packed of basically the best of things that I've learned over the last three to four years of working with clients. Um, this is gonna get you started a heck of a lot faster. And that's why we we set it for free. All right, guys, so looks like we are all set here today. I hope everybody has a great rest of the week and um, we will be streaming again a couple of days from now, probably on Wednesday. So I will see you all then. And yeah, uh, subscribe if you're new here. Smash that like button if you got some value from today's session. Uh, oh, we got a last minute question, it looks like. Jesus is Lord TV. Hi, Derek. I bid for an RFQ, but the CEO said it's under evaluation. Do you of the process, please? So I'm not sure the context of this question. I'm not sure if you submitted and then you're trying to do a follow-up and they're saying it's still being evaluated or you're trying to submit and it's past the due date and it's already moved on and it's and it's trying to be awarded. Um, so I'm not sure what context you're referring to. 
the process is, if you guys don't know, the four stages of a bid, this is how the whole thing works start to finish. Starts out as a source of sought market research. Okay. Contracting officer says, Hey, we're going to have a bid coming out in the future. Okay. If you're interested, send me your capability statement, customized, maybe answer a few questions on white paper and um, let us know you're interested in doing that. Okay. No contract's going to be awarded. This is just to take, take notice. And the purpose of responding to a source of thought can also be to help shape the requirement because say 10 woman owned small businesses respond to a source of thought notice, uh, small business set aside and contracting is trying to figure out which set aside to go with. Well, if they receive 10 WOSBs, when the bid comes out, it will probably be set aside for WOSBs in accordance with whatever the small business goals that that office has. Okay. So that's kind of the, the takeaway of responding to a source of thought, but you don't have to. You can still bid without responding to the source of saw. Stage two, pre-saw. This is an FYI. Hey, just letting you guys know, we received your feedback for the source of saw. Thanks for that. Just letting you know, this is, is in fact going to be WOSB set aside. There is going to be a site visit and the solicitation is going to be released in three weeks from now. So nothing to do, no response required. It is an FYI. You know, mark your calendars. It's coming out. Stage three is the actual solicitation. Okay, so this is where you actually put together your bid, your pricing, whether you're doing technical, past performance, you know, signing the, you know, SF1449 forms, government forms, the reps and certs, whatever. This is where you're actually completing and submitting your bid. And they will give you a formal solicitation for you to read through at this time. And then they will tell you what they want in your bid, which is what we do together on these sessions. And then you give that to them at stage three. And then you, you respond via email most of the time before or by the due date. Okay. And then stage four, the last stage is the award. So the award is made public. It's posted on SAM.gov. You want to make sure you follow or watch those opportunities you're going after on SAM. That way you receive an email notification saying, hey, this opportunity has been updated. The award has been issued. You can go and see who it was awarded to. You can see the dollar value. And that's pretty much about all that they show you. If you are the winner, you will typically be contacted before that's publicly posted via email. And um, they're going to send you the solicitation. They're going to, you know, you're going to sign it, send it back. They're going to sign it and the award's going to be issued. Or they may even have like questions, you know, clarifications to be made before that as well. So that's kind of the whole process in a nutshell. And, um, you know, if you're working with subs or whatever after that, as soon as you win the contract, that's the time to go back to your subs and say, hey, guys, we, we won the contract. If you're going to try to shake the subs down, if that's something that you, you want to do, because now you have more bargaining power because you do have a contract in hand, um, you can do that. Otherwise, you can proceed with cutting a subcontract agreement with them. You know, if you're going to have them sign an NDA or what have you, it's kind of the process that you would go through. You could also do through that. Um, the NDA process with the sub when they're giving you the, the quote as well. You don't have to wait for an award on that. For sure, for sure. So that's kind of the process. Not sure if that answers the question, but it is the general overall process. Yep, for sure. All right, awesome guys. Again, smash that like button, subscribe if you're new here so you can ask questions during future live sessions. That way you don't miss them. And we will see you all later this week with another live. So have a great Monday and we'll see you all next time.